can only imagine. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side.
Miss Children to Children's Church. And believe it or not, we are today in our next to last sermon in the book of Revelation. Uh, We have worked through the book verse by verse uh, over the course of the last year, uh, and we're coming to the end of the book. Um, By the way, there are note sheets in your bulletin today of my outline. There's actually an extra one that will go for today and next week. If you like charts, it's got a couple on there that I think are uh, pretty cool. Uh, We also have these notebooks available to anyone who would want one. They're free in the lobby. If uh, you will take notes in the sermon, uh, we print the note sheets that fit this, and these notebooks are free to anyone uh, who would like to have one. I want to warn you today um, that we are going to look at what many theologians believe is the most somber and difficult passage in the entire Bible, not only in Revelation, but in the entire Bible. Uh, And the idea of that passage is the one that I personally struggle with the most, and that being the doctrine of hell. Uh, People get all bent out of shape about the Trinity. I kind of can wrap my head around that as much as I can and be at peace. And some people get really bent out of shape about Calvinism or Arminianism, and I'm a middle-of-the-road guy. I don't really sweat that too much. But the doctrine of hell is a difficult doctrine. Um, Because the the reality of hell is so horrific and so terrible that I think anyone that has Christ-like compassion and love in our hearts, this is a difficult doctrine, and yet it is what we find in the Scripture. So I want to tell you what we're going to do today, and then in a moment I'm going to pray, because on days like today, we especially need the Holy Spirit to help us take His Word and, and use them and apply them and understand them. Uh, But we're also going to balance that hard passage with one of the most beautiful and encouraging passages in all of the Bible, this idea of the reality of hell, but the reality of heaven. And and I want you just to see in your Bible, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 down to 14, that is the section that details this final judgment, which makes us deal with the doctrine of hell. I want you to see that it is there, and it's important. But my friends, look at Revelation chapter 21 and down to 22. That is the content in Revelation that deals with heaven. And so I am grateful that the Holy Spirit has balanced the word in such a way to where we take a brief glimpse at the doctrine of hell by necessity, and then we're immediately drawn into the reality of heaven to balance that out. Will you pray with me? Because I need it today, especially. Lord Jesus, we believe in you and we believe in your word. Lord, we believe every word of this Bible is inspired, God-breathed, written by the Holy Spirit, and godly men used by the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, help us to come under the authority of your word, even when it's hard or hurtful, even when we don't understand it, help us to come under the authority of your word. As we look at these two doctrines that balance one another, Lord, give us grace. Give us grace to hear. Give us grace to understand, and give us grace to respond. Lord, if there's someone here today, or even someone that will watch this recording later that does not know you, Lord, I pray today that the Holy Spirit would call them by name and draw them into the loving arms of Jesus, our Savior. Lord, hell is nothing to play with. We believe it because the Bible says it's true. And so because we believe you know best, we ask you, Lord Jesus, to make it come alive in our hearts, these words that you have written. Lord, we also thank you for the promise of heaven and the joy unspeakable 
that is in your presence forever and ever. Lord, I pray in the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would protect me from saying anything that's out of your heart, out of alignment with your will. Help us to be somber. Help us to be mindful of this text. We thank you for it, Lord, and we thank you for what you're doing in our church, in our community, and what we believe you're continuing to do in the future. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we begin, I think it's important to lay out just some basics about the doctrine of hell, because if modern Christians balk at this idea of God having wrath at all, and so the doctrine of hell is especially difficult for us. So briefly, I want to just tell you some things without looking at every single place in the Bible hell is mentioned, which is quite a bit. In fact, the Greek word for hell is Gehenna. It's used 12 times in the New Testament. Interestingly enough, out of those 12 times, 11 of them, it is Jesus who uses the word. The only other occurrence comes from James, his half-brother. So I say that to say because we live in a culture that often pits Jesus against Paul and Jesus against... Listen, by the way, that's bad theology. The Holy Spirit anointed Jesus. Jesus was speaking God's word. He is God and was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul in writing Corinthians and Romans and the rest of it, he also was anointed by the Holy Spirit. It is both the word of God. And so every now and then you'll hear some in, in atheists say, well, Paul said that. Jesus never said that. Well, that doesn't even matter to begin with. But in this instance, Jesus is almost the only person that uses the word Gehenna in the entire New Testament. All but one occurrence. So even if you believe that today, you have to take this up with Jesus, not with me or anyone else. Gehenna was a literal place, by the way. Um, it was to the south of Jerusalem. It was a place of historic significance. It is there in the fields of Gehenna that at one point in the Jewish people's history, they were burning their children as sacrifices to pagan gods. In Jesus' day... It was the trash dump of Jerusalem where the trash would perpetually burn and, and the smell and the smoke of that would rise up. And so Jesus uses that vivid imagery to say that the lake of fire is like this. It is a place that no dignified or, or civilized person wants to spend time in. Jesus uses this. I want to give you a quick summary of what the Bible teaches about hell. First, the Bible teaches that hell is a real place. It is an eternal place. In fact, we saw last week that the phrase ever and ever that describes the lake of fire is also used of heaven. And so if you say one is not eternal, then by that logic you have to say that heaven too could also be a temporary existence. Hell is a real and eternal place, the Bible teaches. Another thing it teaches is that it is inescapable once a person is there. It teaches, the Bible teaches that hell is a place of conscious torment and agony and loneliness. Probably most significantly to me is it's a place of separation from God's presence to bless. And that's an important phrase. It isn't that, that God does not have access to hell. It's not that God doesn't know what's going on in hell. No, it is that his presence to bless is completely prevented in this place. To help us understand this, on earth, we have both the consequences of sin and the blessings of God. Paul says in Romans that God makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, meaning that in this world, even bad people get some of God's grace, and even good people, quote-unquote, get some of the problems of living in a cursed existence. In heaven, there is no curse. There is no death. There are no consequences of sin. But in hell, there are none of the blessings and the comforts of God, only the consequences of sin and death eternally. Another thing that the Bible teaches about hell, by the way, and if you have questions about this, I'll be happy to talk to you and give you some scriptures to look at, but I believe the, the scripture actually indicate that there will be different levels of severity in the suffering of hell. The, the lightest place in hell is not a place to be desired. It will be agonizing and terrible, but there are seemingly tears in hell where those who have the most revelation are held to a higher accountability. So my friend, listen to me. If you come to this church or any church where the gospel is preached with a mindset not to follow what Jesus says, you are doing yourself great harm. Because the more you have revealed to you, the more light you have from Christ, the more accountable you are to that light. You say, Pastor, are you telling me I shouldn't come to church? I'm telling you, you shouldn't come to church if you intend to be disobedient to Christ. 
Now, I want you to come to church, but just understand that if you have made up your mind that you will not follow Christ and you are here for some other reason, you are heaping up judgment on yourself by everything you learn and every truth that is revealed. So just be mindful of that. Lastly, I want to tell you this, what I think is the most important thing about hell. It is entirely and completely avoidable if you repent and believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you need not worry about what hell is like because Jesus' arms are open wide to rescue us from the very hell that we deserve. So let's look at the reality of hell in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 down to 15. I want to tell you, uh, you guys know, um, I, I sometimes, by sometimes I mean all the time, uh, get silly when I'm uncomfortable. It's a defense mechanism. Sarcasm comes out and things come out to be funny. Uh, there is nothing to joke about or jest about in this text. And so uh, if I don't think it's going to happen, there won't be much joking going on. This is heavy, serious stuff we're looking at. Look at chapter 20, verse 11 down to 15. We'll read them and come back and look at them verse by verse. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Go to verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire here is Revelation's usage of describing hell a lake that burns with fire. Let's just go through this thing by thing as it made the most sense to me just to go through it in order. The first thing here which we should celebrate is we see a great white throne. You'll remember in the previous uh, text, during the millennial kingdom, John the Beloved saw thrones, plural, set up during the millennial kingdom. I believe that that represents God's people throughout history ruling and reigning with Christ. You may have a different view on that, and that's okay. We can have differing views, but I think that's what makes the most sense. Those thrones represent God's people who will rule and reign with Christ. But notice, this is a great throne. Why? Well, it was impressive to see, but I think it's used here to distinguish it from the other other thrones that have seen in the previous verses. It's not just one of those. Secondly, I think it's great because of the one who sits upon it is great and mighty and awesome, and I believe it's Jesus. Notice that it's a white throne. The fact that the throne is white symbolizes the purity and holiness and justice of this judge and his judgment. By the way, it's important to understand that this judgment seat, this great white throne judgment seat, is different than the judgment seat that believers will attend. Uh, I believe that there's a distinguishment between what's called the Bema seat judgment. Uh, You read about this in Corinthians and other places, and, and there's a chart in your notes, by the way, that outlines the key differences between those two. I don't have time to go through it today, but if you're interested in that, look at it. But just to sum it up this way, at the Bema seat judgment, believers in Christ will stand before God not to deal with their sins, but to be rewarded for their faithfulness and their ministry. And Paul warns, by the way, that it is possible to get into heaven with no rewards. This is not the ideal Christianity. In modern Christianity, it's you just want to do enough to get in. That is not biblical Christianity. Paul says there will be people who get in, by my phrase, by the skin of their teeth. There will be people who get in as through loss, Paul says. That is not what we should aim for. We should aim for to be so pleasing, so faithful to Christ, that on our day before the Bema seat, they back up dump trucks of heavenly rewards. I will tell you why that is important. Because they don't belong to us. That is when we, th- we cast those crowns to the Lord Jesus. You want to be able to give to the Lord as much glory and honor and praise as you can muster. 
My friend, if you're here and you're just trying to get in the gate of heaven, you are looking at the wrong goal. And can I tell you, um, use a strange analogy, I'm a basketball guy and several years ago I was trying to learn how to dunk. Don't laugh at that, I'm being serious. Uh, I, was, I was getting up there, I, I, had a, I have a best friend in Mobile who has darker complexion than I and he can dunk and, and he was teaching me how to dunk. And I would jump and I would smash the ball into the rim and smash the ball into the rim and smash the ball into the rim. And he said to me, Josh, what are you aiming for? I said, I'm aiming for the rim. I got to get to the rim. He said, no, man, you got to look at the top of the goal because you got to get over what you're aiming for. If your goal is just to get in, you're probably going to come short. The goal is how far can I run for the glory of Christ? How much can I honor him? People say, I I, I don't know if I'm saved. By the way, we're going to do a series on that in February, how you can know that you're a believer. But my friend, if you think you're just going to sneak into heaven by the skin of your teeth, that is not a wise or safe way to deal with this God who we're going to see today in this text. You should push for him, run for him. But I believe that's what the Bema Seat is about. This judgment is different. We're going to look at it. Notice it simply doesn't even attempt to describe him who sits upon the throne. By the way, the word throne appears almost 50 times in the book of Revelation. Different people sit on different thrones. So who is seated on this throne in judgment? I'll just point your attention to a couple of references in Revelation that that say that God himself is seated on the throne. Revelation 7, verse 10, the martyrs from the tribulation cried out, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Chapter 19, verse 4, the 24 elders, who again, I believe, represent believers, and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. In Revelation 3.21, Jesus says, I also overcame, now listen, and sat down with my Father on his throne. And so I believe that this throne is occupied by God. More specifically, I believe this throne is occupied by Jesus. The reason I believe that is throughout the New Testament, it seems pretty clear that Jesus is the one who will issue judgment. Consider what Jesus says himself in John chapter 5, verse 22. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. A couple verses down in verse 26 and 27, he goes on, For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. I believe the New Testament is very clear here that Jesus is the one seated on this throne. There are many places in the Scripture that tell us that Jesus, the Son of God, will judge the living and the dead. So, by the way, when you hear someone say, and they quote Jesus to say it, judge not lest you be judged, you need to remind them that the guy who said that is going to judge the living and the dead. The guy who said that has no problem issuing judgment. This idea that you can't judge me or no one can judge me. By the way, that's true. Did you know that? We cannot issue judgment. But that is a different thing than us proclaiming the judgment that Christ has already made. If Christ says something is sinful, I am not judging a person to inform them that the judge before whom they will stand has said that that is sinful. That is a loving warning to say, repent, so this judge will not find fault in you. You don't have to judge anyone, but we do have to pronounce the judgments that God has made. That's our job. And by the way, we start with our own selves with that. Hypocrisy and legalism come from when we try to impose God's justice and his rules on other people instead of our own selves. Or we do so trying to earn our own self in self-righteousness. What about this phrase, heaven and earth fled away from Jesus and no place was found for them? Now, I, I want to tell you, I, I, I thought about not saying this. This week as I prepared this, this sermon... I just was so overwhelmed. I spent hours looking into the doctrines of hell and heaven, and I was just like in my office at my desk with tears in my eyes as I thought about these realities. And, and I had to stop. I had to, I had to get a coffee break because I just knew that if I kept going in that moment, I was going to come out, and Teresa and Lori, who work in our office, would just think, you know, some un- terrible thing had happened because I was just, I was, but imagine this scene, this white throne, Jesus in his glory sitting there to judge, and heaven heaven and earth just disappear from his presence. Well, you say, what does that mean? I believe, and most theologians believe this, this is the uncreation of the creation. God spoke the universe into being with a word. The Bible says that Jesus sustains the creation by the word of his power. And so too, he will uncreate the universe with a word. What a display. 
to watch the heavens and the earth just get sucked back into oblivion at the word of Christ. But what does this have to do with judgment? This whole context is standing before the judge. I don't know that this is all it means, but I think, for me, there will be no place to hide before this king. When Moses wanted to see the glory of God, what did God tell him to do? Hide your face in a mountain. I love that. Not a pillow, not a peekaboo, no, a mountain. And even then, I only want you to catch the last tail of my glory. There will be no mountain to hide from before the eyes of this judge. There will be no sea of separation. There will be nothing to hide from. These people will stand before this judge naked and exposed and unhidden. Nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. Just his justice. He says that he saw the dead. Now, I need to point out something here. If you remember in the previous verses, those who were believers already had a resurrection. I believe they rule and reign with Christ during the millennial kingdom. You, again, may have a different view of that, but I believe that's what the text indicates. The dead here that are resurrected are not believers. We know that because of their destination. We know that because of the way Jesus deals with them. And can I tell you, as I study the doctrine of hell, I am so grateful that I do not have to stand before God and give an account for every sin that I've ever committed. If you are in Christ, do you know that that's the reality for you? Because Christ has so fully paid for your sin and taken the wrath of God for your sin, you don't have to give an account to him on judgment day. The Bema Seat's about rewards. There's never a place in the scripture that says the Bema Seat deals with sin at all. The sin was dealt with by Christ. These folks have to deal with their sin before Jesus. These are unbelievers. What does he see about these dead people? First, he says, great and small. There will be no special treatment in this judgment. The rich and poor, the strong and weak, the great and small will stand before this judge. Theologian named John Phillips said it this way. Little men and paltry women whose lives were filled with pettiness, selfishness, and nasty little sins will be there. Those whose lives amounted to nothing will be there, whose very sins were drab and dowdy, mean, spiteful, peevish, groveling, vulgar, common, and cheap. The great will be there, men who sinned with a high hand, with dash and courage and flair. Men like Alexander and Napoleon, Hitler and Stalin will be present. Men who went in for wickedness on a grand scale with the world for their stage and who died unrepentant at last, end quote. The great and the small. And again, I believe that there are different tiers in the punishment of hell. But every person outside of the blood of Christ will stand before this king and give an account. Can you imagine every sinful word, thought, and deed having to explain to Jesus, being told with perfect clarity exactly why you're guilty, exactly what you've done, all the things you thought no one knew you did and said and thought exposed to be seen. I want to tell you, I want no part in the wrath of God. I want no part in this great white throne judgment. And I believe in Christ you can avoid it altogether. Now notice this, books were opened. There are are two books here. I want to tell you what I think they are. One is clearly defined. I think the other one is defined by implication. The first, the one that's a little more vague, is I believe the book's of their deeds, a record of these people's lives and sins. Look at Revelation 20, verse 12. We see this. And I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Now notice there are multiple books of deeds. There's only one book of the Lamb's book of life. I think the deeds are written down. We also see the same thing in verse 13 of chapter 20, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, how? According to their deeds. Go to chapter 21, verse 8. This is after the heaven section. I'm going to throw in all the hell stuff at the beginning so we can end on the positive stuff. 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. My friend, if you are sitting here and you think Jesus does not care about the sin in your life, you think Jesus does not hold you accountable to the rebellious acts of sin in your life, you need to read your Bible. He takes seriously sin. 
You say, what is his deal? Why is it such a big deal? Because every act of sin is an act of open rebellion against his lordship, his kingship, his authority. He says, don't murder. You say, I am my own boss. I'll do what I want to. He says, don't lie. You say, he can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to. It is not just about the little things we do and say and think. It is about an attack on the sovereignty of the God who created and sustains the universe. You do, we do this with our children, right? In our house, we know. We had a conversation about it this morning in our house. We're trying to help our children understand that lying is a severely consequential thing because it grieves the heart of God and it grieves our relationship and it grieves our ability to trust you. But what do we do in our sinful nature? It's just a little white lie. No, that little white lie is an assault on the sovereign God who set rules in his universe and said, this is how you ought to live. It's just, a, it's, you know, just is a terrible word when we're dealing with sin. It's just a little lust. It's just a little flirtation. It's just a white lie. Just is the word of the damned, my friends. Because someone who has the spirit of God, those little just sins, you will be convicted. You will be in agony in your spirit because there is no just. I disappointed the Jesus who died to save me. No. I come to him and I weep in repentance. I want to tell you some things the Bible says about these words. I got really fixated on this. I'll go through this quickly, but I think these things are very important. These books, the first are books of our deeds. What does that mean? Well, the Bible tells us that our sinful thoughts will be judged. Several places in the scripture, I'll just give you a couple. Speaking of a person's thought life, Paul wrote on that day, When according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ in Romans 2.16. The context there is what you think and what you believe is right and wrong. Jesus in his earthly ministry often would, would understand what people around him were thinking and the motivations of their heart. That was in his incarnation. When he had veiled some of his divine attributes, he was divine, he always was divine, but he didn't act on his omniscience, for example. He didn't act on his omnipresence in that moment. In his incarnation, he could look at people and say, I know what you're thinking. You think that Jesus, who's perfectly glorified, resurrected, and reigning, won't know what you're thinking? Well, you can fool me, my friend. You can put your church clothes and your church smiles on, and I can fool you, but you cannot fool this Jesus who knows every thought and motive of your heart. And one day, if you're not in the blood of Christ, you will stand and give an account for every thought that displeased and dishonored him. That ought to terrify us. Secondly, Jesus himself tells us that our sinful words will be judged. He says in Matthew 12, 37, that a person's words will play a role in, quote, either condemning or justifying them. Jesus goes on to say that you really want to know what's in somebody's heart, that the overflow of our heart comes out in what we say. And Jesus says every idle word will be judged and held accountable. Now, can we just think about this week? I'm not thinking about the totality of your life. How many things have you said or thought this week that dishonored Jesus? that displeased God. You say, well, does it count when I'm driving? Yes, it counts the most. You say, when I'm in Walmart, does it count the thoughts? Yes, it counts. Because Jesus is going to count. My friend, if you're not in the blood of Christ, every thought, every word, every deed written down in a book. What are you going to say? No, I didn't. that wasn't me. You got the wrong guy to the one who knows everything, to the one who formed you in your mother's womb, to the one who knit your DNA together like a basket, you're going to look at him and say, you got it wrong? I don't think so. I'm always amazed when I see atheists, who, when, they're, when they're asked, what are you going to say when you stand before? They're like, I'm going to stand there, and I'm going to... No, you will not. You will not. Not in the presence of... When you tell me, you watch all of creation get sucked into an atom of nothingness at the word of this Jesus... Anybody else got anything to say? No. Well, the arrogance to say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to stand there and I'm going to give him what for. No, you will not. You will stand there naked and guilty and ashamed as every detail of our sinful life is pointed out in clarity and precision. Lastly, the Bible says that sinful deeds will be judged. 
In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the final two verses of that chapter, this is what Solomon writes, the conclusion, meaning the conclusion of these things I've been talking about. When all has been heard is this, fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Ecclesiastes is kind of a depressing book if you ever read it. I love it. Maybe it's because I I struggle with depression and I kind of understand some of that stuff. The whole point of Ecclesiastes is everything is pointless without God in your life. Solomon says, I've got money. I've got women. Did he have women? Oh, he had a lot of women, beautiful women, lots of them, way too many of them. He had gold. He had drink. He had parties. He had friends. He had everything he could ever want. He said, it's all vanity. Solomon says, it's like trying to catch the wind in a net. It's just a waste of time. And he ends by saying this, here's the thing you need to know. What we do on earth matters because each of us will have to stand in judgment one day. Jesus says the same thing in Luke chapter 8, verse 17. Now listen to this. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Oh my, we think we are so clever sometimes, don't we? Let me tell you what, if you're in unrepentant sin and you think to yourself, I can get away with this, I'm smart enough to cover my tracks. Sometimes people in sin are so blinded by their sin, they actually enjoy that process. Look how smart I am. I'm getting away with this. Nobody knows. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody knows. And I believe in this life, those sins will come to fruition. They will be seen even in this life. The Bible says your sins will find you out. I think that means in this life, you can expect consequences will follow. So listen, my friend, if you are in unrepentant sin today, you need to repent and run to Jesus before the consequences pour on you. But my friend, even if it never catches up to you in this life, on this day, for the people who are not in Christ, everything is exposed. You may have fooled everyone your whole life. You may have even fooled yourself. This Jesus on this throne, he says, here it is, dates, times, motives, thoughts, words, actions, all of it. We have several guys in law enforcement here. How would you like to have that kind of, you know, caseload to go take to a prosecutor? I can tell you what they were thinking at this nanosecond. You wouldn't even need a court, would you? The guy would just condemn himself. This Jesus is going to hold to account every unbeliever, every sin, every thought, every word. My friend, if you are not in Christ today, you need to run to him for salvation. Because this same Jesus who will judge you is also the same Jesus who died to save you from judgment. Notice this, we'll keep going. The sea gives up their dead. I think that this is a reference here. Um, To help us understand, sometimes people ask about, like, what about cremation? What about things like that? I think the point here is even people that die at sea, that their bodies are decomposed and they're, you know, fish food. I don't mean that irreverently, but that's just the way biology works. That that even someone destroyed that thoroughly can be resurrected in the resurrection, either to life or to death. I think that's the point of the sea here. But then it says this, that death and Hades gave up their dead as well. And then notice that death and Hades are eventually thrown into the lake of fire. I believe the word death here is is speaking about the physical act of dying. Whereas Hades, I believe, is the spiritual place where unbelievers go at their time of death. This is what I believe the Bible teaches. That when an unbeliever dies today, they go to a place called Hades, which is not a fun place to be in, by the way. But it is not the lake of fire that we're going to talk about in a moment. We know that because Hades itself will be thrown into the lake of fire, so it seems like it's a different place. Uh, By the way, that may prompt you to wonder, well, what about a believer who dies today? Well, we're going to see in a minute that God, Jesus, is going to remake heaven and earth from scratch. He's going to make a new heaven, a better heaven. So I can tell you this, I believe the Bible's clear, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I believe those who are in Christ who die, they go to be with Jesus, but they don't go to the heaven we're going to see here in Revelation 21, because that hasn't been built yet. They go to a place, we could call it heaven, we could call it paradise, we can call it something, but the thing we're going to look at in a minute, get ready for, that's not even been built yet. And the lake of fire, as of right now, I believe is empty. We saw the first two people to inhabit it are the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Bible refers to this place, this place called hell, as the second death. 
the lake of fire. I want to just remind you of the last two verses that we looked at, and then we're going to get to the heaven part of this, which I'm hoping is is true for everyone here. Look at verses 14 and 15 of chapter 20. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Look at verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Remember, there's two books. There's the books of all your deeds, which, by the way, we all have those books. We all have deeds that we're guilty. What's the difference between those who go to heaven and those who go to hell? It has everything to do with the second book. Everybody here has the books. Amen? You know, this week, I, I saw on your face, some of you broke eye contact with me. When I talked about your words this week, you're like, he knows. We all have mess and sin and rebellion in our lives. Even as believers, we still stumble and struggle with things. The only difference is the second book. If your name is in the Lamb's book of life, heaven. If your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, hell. That is the dividing line. It's Jesus. Have you come to him in faith? Are you God's child by trusting in Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, not your works, not your life, not your righteousness, not your whatever, but you're trusting in Christ? That is the singular difference. You think Jesus is a big deal now? He is literally what your eternity hinges upon. Praise God, we've got people joining our church, and I'm not addressing this to any of you specifically, but I want you to understand, joining a church does not get a person into heaven. Being baptized does not get a person into heaven. Singing and teaching and all the good things that we can do. You say, what if I'm really generous and I give a lot of money to the church? That will not get you into heaven. Heaven is not a timeshare that you can just throw money at, and God says, hey, you've bought your way in here. There's one way, and that's Christ. All that other stuff, if it doesn't come from a heart that's already in love with Jesus and and caught on to Jesus and clinging to Jesus, it means nothing, and it will burn up. So I I just want you to know, we're going to talk about heaven. I want you to be excited about it. I don't want to talk any more about hell today just because it's a heavy thing for my heart and yours. Let's talk about heaven. Look at Revelation 21, verses 1 down to 7. I think this is so amazing. Look at chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now listen, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, you say, why did you put heaven and hell in the same sermon? Because of that very thing. Because I don't know about you, but looking at hell microscopically, it's hard. It hurts. And then you shift. How how much joy must have filled John's heart? Then I saw something else, meaning there's a new vision here. Then I saw a throne come up. I saw people judged. I saw the lake of fire. But then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. You feel how that just washes over you like a breath of fresh air? Let's talk about it. A new heaven and a new earth. As we saw in chapter 20, verse 11, before the awesome judgment seat of Christ, earth and heaven fled away and had no place to be found for them. So the old heaven and the old earth have been uncreated. So now there's a need to make another. Can I just tell you, this is the part where I really got choked up this week. In the first creation, we don't know that anyone was there to witness it other than God himself. Perhaps the angels were. There's different views on that. 
The angels had to be created at some point too, so we know that they weren't there at their own creation because that would be logical. But check this out. At the second creation, if you are in Christ, you will get to sit back and watch God create a new and better physical and spiritual plane from nothing. I'm just telling you, that is awesome. To be able to sit there. Now listen, I love our creation. The Bible tells us through and through, the stars proclaim the glories of God. The the creation itself is worshiping. But Romans tells us that the creation is also groaning because it's been cursed by our sin. So listen, if you love mountains and oceans and stars and all of the things that God has created like I do, if it draws your heart into a place of worship, I want to just tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because this is the broken old model. This is the model that the thorns and death and sickness has pillaged and plundered. This second earth, this second heaven will have none of that. It'll be like the Garden of Eden throughout all of existence. There's so many things in heaven you won't need. You won't need locks on your door. You won't need a weed whacker. I mean, just start thinking about the things in your life. They have no purpose in heaven. Fire extinguishers, get rid of them. Weapons, get rid of them. I don't even know if you need a toilet there. I'm just, I just, I don't know. There's so many things in heaven that you just don't need because there's no curse. There's no, there's none of that. And again, I just think that's going to be amazing to sit back and watch. One thing real quick, we'll only touch this very briefly because it kind of hurt my heart when I, when I thought about this as a kid. No sea, uh, S-E-A, no, no ocean, no sea. I mean, what's God's problem with the ocean? You know, he gets rid of the sea. It's like, I think of, and you probably do, we live on the coast, and I assume you like water at least a little bit if you live in this area, that, that when you look at the ocean, like when you look at the stars or the mountains, it draws us into a place of worship. We say, God made that. And all the critters in there, God made them. So what is, what is going on here? I want to just give you really briefly, because it's not really that important. I just thought it was worth talking about. What's this about, that there won't be any sea? And isn't it funny? John just kind of throws it in there. God's going to make a new heaven and earth. Oh, by the way, there won't be a sea. It's like, what, could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that? I'll give you three choices. Um, there may be others, and you can choose between these which ones you like. If you take this literally, then kiss the sea goodbye, no sea, period. That one's easy. Unless you like to see, uh, then it's not so fun for you. Secondly, I think there's a historical way we could look at this. When God created the earth, all of the land was collected together. Uh, scientists refer to this landmass as Pangea, and believe it or not, the Bible actually testifies to this as well. Meaning that if you take a map, you see how the continents look like they should just all lock together like puzzle pieces. What we believe is that that's exactly how God created the creation. Uh, the, bu- the book of Genesis says, in, in the days of Peleg, the land separated. And so the Bible testifies to this as well. So some people think that they're not being a sea simply as saying that, that God kind of liked everybody being able to have access to each other, and the sea separated people, and all the land masses may come back together. It could be that simple. Or we could take this metaphorically. Some theologians point out that the sea has been used throughout Revelation in metaphorical ways. I'll give you a couple of examples. It's been used seemingly to depict the origin of cosmic evil. It's been used to describe the unbelieving rebellious nations who caused tribulation for God's people. It's been used to refer to the place of the dead, the primary location of the world's idolatrous trade activity, and others. So it could be that simply John, using that metaphor as he's used it in other places in this book, is saying none of those things will be in this new heaven and new earth. There won't be idolatrous kingdoms. There won't be death. There won't be spiritual wickedness in these things. So again, I'm not going to camp out here too long, but I just thought that was interesting. Again, you can choose which of those three or any of them or none of them or other things, and I still will love you because I don't think it's that important. When we get to heaven, uh, we will find out. You know, that's one of those questions. When we see this, you're going to figure out, okay, uh, I I get it now, all right? Uh, And for right now, we'll just keep moving. New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Uh, We're going to actually spend next week studying this, um, so I'm going to be kind of brief here, but just to point out a couple of things. This New Jerusalem is a holy city. That means it's both set apart. It literally comes out of heaven where God is, And it's also morally pure and righteous. We see that because it's like an honored bride coming from heaven adorned for her husband. Uh, Holiness in in Greek and Hebrew both convey separation and holiness and purity. And I believe both of those things are present in this new Jerusalem. 
Now, I want to point this out, too, because I think this is important. This city is not merely a place, but it's also to represent a people. The bride of Christ represents the church. That's the imagery that's being used here about this city. So this new Jerusalem is both to indicate a location, but also to identify those who will inhabit it. All of God's people throughout the ages, nations and people, will be there. And you want to talk about a praise party? Let me tell you what. If after you see God create a new heaven and a new earth and a new city comes down, which, by the way, is absolutely mind-boggling beautiful. We'll see in the next passage. We don't even know what some of the rocks that are. we just like, I don't know. I have no idea. But let me tell you what. If you see all of that, and I see you, and we're starting up the, the holy choir of angels and saints, and you're standing there like this, somebody's going to have to keep me off of you, man. They better have Peter or somebody hold me back, because that is, that is not the appropriate response to what we have seen. By the way, it's not the appropriate response even here on earth, is it? I'm going to tell you what, if you see God create a new creation, a new perfect world, a new perfect heaven, and you're not just jazzed about that, I don't know what to tell you. We'll look at that next week. What I want to focus on today is the voice of this king. We see this loud voice. Uh, John loves to write that, a loud voice, a loud voice. It comes from the throne. We've already seen that Jesus is seated on the throne, uh, so I believe it's his voice. There are different views about that, but I personally think it's his. Now look at what he says. First thing, he says, God dwells with his people. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Chapter 21, verse 3 says, Go to chapter 21, verse 22. We haven't got this far. We'll look at this again next week, but I just want you to see it. I saw no temple in the new Jerusalem, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. I mean, there's no special place to be in the presence of God there, because in that place is in the presence of God fully everywhere you go. That is awesome. Now, throughout the Bible, God has sought an intimate relationship with his creation. I'll give you a couple of examples. God would meet with Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. And after that, he couldn't deal with sinful man directly because they can't stand in his perfect presence. But God met with Abraham and Moses and other Old Testament saints in various ways, the, the burning bush. God led the Hebrews out of Egypt in the Exodus as a pillar of fire and smoke. And then God instructed the people to make the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle where they could deal with his presence. If you remember, Moses would deal with his presence face to face. King David designed an elaborate temple, which his son Solomon constructed. There, the Ark of the Covenant resided, and God's presence was there. After that temple was destroyed, the books of Nehemiah and Ezra detail the rebuilding of the second temple, where, again, the Holy Spirit resided. In the incarnation where Jesus came to the earth, God dwelt among men in the person of Jesus, the second member of the Trinity. After his death and resurrection on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and indwelled the believers, all believers. So now God is with all believers in Christ. When you look at the Bible, you see this idea over and over and over again. God wants to have a relationship with us. He has to limit the connection because of our sinfulness. There has to be some, some mountains in between us to keep us from dying from the sheer awesome, holy glory of God. But he wants a relationship with us. And all throughout the Bible, you see him intervene and connect with people as he can through whatever means they can have. And now as a New Testament believer, if you are in Christ, you have, Jesus says, this is going to be different when the Holy Spirit comes because he will not only be with you, but he will be in you. I love this, by the way. When Jesus was living on earth in his incarnation, he was, he was only in one place at one time. He wasn't living in his omnipresence. But then Jesus dies and he resurrects and he ascends and he sends the Holy Spirit to every single believer. You know why that's so cool? Because now where Jesus was only in one place at one time in his incarnation, in the church, the Holy Spirit is in thousands and thousands and thousands of people all over the earth. 
And the same Holy Spirit that worked in Jesus' life, as it's different, we're not like Jesus in that sense, but the Holy Spirit was working in Jesus' life too. That same Holy Spirit indwells us today. That means we have access to the wisdom of God and the strength of God and the truth of God because his spirit is in us. It's why when you read the Bible, you ever have this happen? This happens to me like every week. You can ask Lori and Teresa, they're in the office with me. I come in, I pound my head on the counter and the wall and I'm like, I don't know how to preach this. I don't understand. You ever have that happen? You read your Bible and you're like, I have no idea what this is meaning and how I can apply this to my life. And then you begin to pray and you begin to seek the Lord and it's like somebody just flips a switch and you're like, ah, why didn't I see that before? My friend, that's the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't walk away and say, man, I'm really smart. I'm getting this down. No, that's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, look, I know you're slow. Let me show you what this is about. Guys, every week it's for me. How am I going to, especially in Revelation, how am I going to preach this? I don't understand it. I got to help you understand it. And I study and I pray and I study and I pray. And then the Holy Spirit flips the switch. He sheds his light on the scriptures and he says, here's what you do. That's an awesome thing. But check this out. In the new heaven and the new earth, you want to be where God is? He's everywhere. His presence fills up the city. Jesus is there. The Father is there. The Spirit is there. The apostles are there. The Old Testament saints are there. Every person who's covered in the blood of Jesus is there. And we praise him forever and ever and ever. Amen. New heaven, new earth. But check this out. Not only does God want to dwell with people, he has set out to redeem his people. What is the heavenly city going to be like? Again, we're going to look at this next week in more detail. But it's interesting today, in our passage, John doesn't explain what it's like. He explains it in a negative. What I mean by that is, he doesn't tell you what it's like, he tells you what it's not like. He tells you what's not there. And he gives us five things that in this heavenly city, and you need to understand, this isn't me saying this, this is the voice from the throne. Look at it again, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, I believe it's Jesus, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now listen, verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Now can you just wrap your head around that? Man, I love this. God does not say to his angels, hey, we got a bunch of crying folks. Go take some Kleenex out there. Tell them we don't do that here. No. What does this text say? The voice from the throne. I believe it's Jesus. I'm going to be with you. You're going to be with me. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And I will come and wipe the tears from your eyes individually, personally. I just love that picture. It's like when Jesus comes in Thessalonians, he comes with the cry of an archangel and a trumpet, but he doesn't send an archangel to come get his people. He comes and gets us himself. Check out the things that are not in heaven. You probably saw them. We've looked at it twice. No tears in heaven. No death in heaven. The third one is kind of obvious. If the second one's not there, there's no mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. No crying, no pain, no death, no mourning. And so John doesn't even try to tell us what it's like at this point. He just says there's some things missing. Some things that you've gotten accustomed to. But they just don't have any place in this kingdom. By the way, we can add to this list a couple of things that we've seen in Revelation as well. Things that are also missing. Sin is missing from this city. And when sin is gone, the curse of sin is gone. My personal favorite, Satan, is gone. We saw what happened to him last week. Bound in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever, never to assault and deceive God's people again. Heaven. It's going to be a beautiful place. John just points us to the things that are missing. The last thing I just want to share with you about heaven is this. And if this sounds familiar to you, uh, it should. Um, Jesus wins. 
We have said that every week, I think, in our study of Revelation. That is what this book is about. Jesus wins over every heartache, every sin, every enemy. He wins. I want to just show you how heaven ties into that. Look again at verses 6 and 7. I love this. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Ladies, don't feel left out. I believe that son there could just be my children. But check this out. I love this. You guys know I'm a Bible nerd. It is done. Now, that should sound familiar to some other key thing that happens in the Scripture. To Tetelestai in Greek. It is finished. Jesus' utterance on the cross. What I think is so cool about this, when Jesus says it is finished on the cross, he's finishing the redemptive plan. I'm paying the sacrifice that will allow you to be redeemed and rescued. And it's an accounting term, Miss Rachel. It means paid in full. You've got a debt. You can't pay it. Jesus comes along and says, put their bill on my tab. Give them my, my freedom, and I'm going to pay the consequence for them. It is done. It is finished. Paid in full. And so listen, my friend, when the devil comes at you and starts throwing your books of deeds in your face, if you are in Christ, you can look at that devil and say, it is finished. Jesus paid for it all. So you go talk to him. Because I'm not that guy. And Paul says, I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm not that guy. You go talk to Jesus. He's the one who paid my tab. But here he he brings it full circle. It is done. Not the same phrase in Greek, but a similar one. It is finished. Redemption is offered. It is done. Redemption is completed. Brings you full circle. By the way, there's no room in any of this to think that we're getting ourselves to heaven, is there? He's the one that did it. He's the one that finished it. He's the one who sent his spirit so we wouldn't mess it up. And he's the one that brings it to completion. Let me tell you what, there will be no one in this event that sees God uncreate the universe with a word and then recreate another one, an even better one, with a word. None of us are going to be like, yeah, you're lucky to have me here. No. There will be none of that. It's going to be like, whoa. Whoa. That's a very theological word. When Isaiah saw God in heaven, what did he say? Whoa. Whoa is me. Right? This is going to be a sight, but check this out. Jesus wins. I love that. It is finished. You know, you know, you know how you know someone is sovereign? When he's the only one who can say, period, done. I don't care what Satan says about it. I don't care what the law says about it. I don't care what the world says about it. I don't even really care about what the church says about it. Jesus is the one who decides when it's done. You take it up with him. Let's see you make a universe by the word of your power. Let's see you wrap up human history. It's finished. And then he says these phrases. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. If you don't know, that's the first letter in the Greek alphabet and the last letter in the Greek alphabet. We would say it today, I am the A and the Z. I, I'm, all, I'm all over this story. You can't, you can't have this story without the beginning that I've made and the ending that I've made. He goes on to just say he's the beginning and the end. I love that. I mean, it's not trash talking because it's true, but Jesus here is saying, I started this story. And I'm still standing at the end of it. Where are my enemies? They're gone. Where are the accusers and the deceivers? They're gone. I'm the first. I'm the last. But check this out. When Jesus wins, he doesn't just just win for himself, but he wins for his people. Immediately after saying that he has finished it, Look at what he says at the end of verse 6. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. The one who overcomes will inherit what things? Heaven. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, wiping tears, no death, no mourning. That is the inheritance of the overcomer. Remember, that's a very common word in the book of Revelation. All the seven churches were told, if you overcome, if you overcome, if you overcome, if you overcome. If you are here today, you need to know what it means to be an overcomer. 
Because the difference between heaven and hell is are you an overcomer or not? That's what Jesus just said. If you overcome, you inherit these things. If you don't overcome, you do not inherit these things. I don't know how to make that dividing line any more clear to you. What does it mean to be an overcomer? Keep your finger here in Revelation. I want you to find the short book of 1 John, which we're going to start studying next month. 1 John chapter 4. This is written by the same guy that wrote Revelation, John the Beloved. Look at 1 John chapter 4. I'm sorry, I've got the wrong thing here now that I'm looking at it. 3 verse 4. I'm just going to read it to you because I wrote it down wrong in my notes. I apologize for that. I will fix that and get it right to you. Sometimes I make typos in my notes. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Are you an overcomer? How, How do I know? Have you placed your faith in Christ? That's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that determines heaven and hell. All of the other stuff we do, church membership, baptism, serving, feeding the poor and clothing the poor and worshiping and teaching and preaching, all of those other things that we do are out of that. They come out of that. Let me tell you, if you are a Christian, you should be motivated to do those things. You should be motivated to serve God and his people. You should be motivated. You should have a heart to reach people for Jesus. But none of those things apart from faith in Christ will save you. Heaven or hell? Overcomers versus those who are overcome. Believers versus unbelievers. Now that's terribly simple, isn't it? It is not hard to understand. Man, it's hard to do. It's hard to die to yourself and come humbly to Jesus and say, I can't save myself, and I need you to save me. Any man here say that's the cry of your heart today, that you just, that was easy for you to get to that point? I don't think so, because we want to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. We want to do it. We want to carry our own weight, and and there's good thoughts there, but this is a weight you cannot carry. The scriptures give us a clear contrast between two eternal places, heaven and hell. Hell is a place where all of God's grace and blessings are forever removed, and only his wrath and vengeance are found. Heaven is a place where only God's presence to bless can be found, and there is freedom from sin, death, pain, and sorrow. I've tried my best, as the time permits, to explain the differences in these eternal destinations. I've prayerfully tried to make clear what human words cannot fully explain. The terrors of hell are beyond human speech and thought. And the glories of heaven are beyond human speech and thought. So how do we respond to these unspeakable, unimaginable things? There's two ways. First, we should consider, you should consider your own standing with this King Jesus who will judge the living and the dead. The sad truth is that we all deserve God's wrath. We all deserve hell. But God in his infinite mercy has made a way for us to escape his wrath by pouring it out on his son, Jesus. But this payment only extends to those who place their faith in him fully and sincerely. Again, church membership is great, but it won't do it. Baptism is great. Good works are great. But they're no replacement for being born again by clinging to Jesus to save you. Jesus is the only way to escape this judgment. How do you respond to today's sermon? If you have not come to Jesus in repentance and faith to be saved, run to him today. You say, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a member of our church that has their hand in everything we do and you serve at a high level. If you do not belong to Jesus, you run to Jesus today. Man, I've seen pastors come down at an altar call because they realize that their faith was in their self and not in Jesus. I don't care who you are. You may be the worst sinner that's carrying a burden that nobody, nobody here knows about. There's forgiveness for you in the arms of this judge, this Jesus, this king. You run to him today. And you grab onto him and you don't let go. Secondly, assuming that you've done that already, For those of us who've come to Jesus for his forgiveness and freedom, today's sermon ought to encourage us. First, it should encourage us to be people of 
grateful praise that instead of the hell we deserve, God has prepared a perfect heaven for us. In fact, he's done all the work to make it available for us. So one way you can take this with you is it should motivate us to be people of praise. You say, I, I, I'm scared. If, if I put my hands, we were kind of joking about this in my house today. If you put your hands up too high, like where's the Baptist limit, you know? Can I, can I come down here? Man, I'm going to tell you what, that, that ceases to matter when you understand the magnitude of God's grace that he's set on you. Let them think you're a fool. Be a fool for Christ. I don't care. But let us not be a people that, start, that constantly hold our praise in as if it's something to be ashamed of. You say, Pastor, I think you're kind of Pentecostal. No, I'm biblical. And the Bible is filled with story after story where men and women were not ashamed to weep before the Lord and shout for joy before the Lord and lift hands to the Lord and fall down as dead men before the Lord. In the book of Revelation, the angels who Roman centurions faint when they see, they're praising Jesus. They're not ashamed. We ought to be motivated to be men and women of praise. And can I tell you, if your heart is for your children and grandchildren to know Jesus, You stifling the praise that's in your heart is a sure way to tell them that other things matter more than he. Let your kids think you're weird. You're already an embarrassment to them anyway. (laughs) It might as well be for the Lord's sake. But secondly, it should motivate us in another way. If we take the Bible seriously, we must believe what it says about hell. We should shudder at the thought of anyone spending eternity there. We must preach and teach and plead with men to run to this Jesus. We must warn them to come into his family. And I know because I'm privileged to have people come in my office week after week and tell me their prayer needs. And and a lot of times it's praying for someone that they know and love who doesn't know Christ. I know that you have that burden on your heart. Sometimes we don't have the boldness to go with the burden. Sometimes we don't have the wisdom we need to speak and when not to speak. But if this is true, and I believe it is, we have to make a fuss and plead with people. Do not go to this place when Christ's arms are open wide. That's what I do every Sunday. My job is is actually pretty easy. I have one sermon in my tool bag. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Run to him. It's in every page of the Bible. It's in every text and every story and every subtext. It's the one thing I've got to tell you every week. And if you've come to him, then it changes everything. And your life is forever different. And when I say forever different, I mean forever different. Because in heaven, it's forever and ever and ever and ever Praising Jesus, serving Jesus, loving Jesus, loving each other, serving each other. What a beautiful picture. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, I am begging you. And and 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that God is pleading through us. So as I'm pleading, I really believe God is pleading with you. Do not tempt this hell. Run to Jesus. Be saved. You say, how do I do that? It's the hardest thing you'll ever do because it requires you not to do something. It requires you to come to Jesus and say, I cannot do this. And so I need you to do this for me on my behalf. And I'm trusting in what you have done. There's going to be this thing that wells up in you where you want to do something that comes after In this moment, if you're here and you don't know Christ, the thing you do is you stop trying to do it and you cling to Jesus. If you're here today and you know Christ, but today has stirred you up to evangelism or to worship or to repentance, then I'm asking you to take those things seriously as well. We're going to have a time of invitation and I'm I'm going to make myself available and uh, Brother Corey, I'm going to ask you to come down as well. Um, and by the way, if, if any of our uh, mature men and women of, of God want to come up during the altar call, I think it'd be cool to have ladies up here and men up here so it's not just me. But we're going to be available here to pray with you and to talk with you. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ, before you walk out those doors, consider what God's word has said. It is a warning from God. 
I'm just asking you to prayerfully consider it. Will you stand and sing? Or actually, we're not going to sing today. We're just going to pray.